just pray first. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your Shabbat, that we can come together and worship you and glorify and lift up your name. Pray, Father, that you help us understand your word as we discuss and teach your word today. We thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So today we're going to be talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, which is coming up very soon. So that being said, again, there are a wide variety of views on the Feast of Tabernacles. But today we're just going to highlight the main points and keep it simple. There's an idiom we have here in Australia, is the simple things in life are often the best. So we're just going to keep it simple and not complicate things. So that being said, this is the seventh and final feast of the year. Starts with a high Sabbath. What does that mean? It means it's a Sabbath that's outside of the normal weekly Sabbath. So it starts with a high Sabbath on the first day and it finishes with a high Sabbath on the eighth day. However, these Sabbaths can fall on a normal Sabbath, depending on what time, what year and calendar that you're on. The last of the three three feasts where they had to go to Jerusalem. So this Feast of Tabernacles is the last of those three times a year when Yahweh says that you shall come before me. This is the last of those three times. This is also known as the season of our joy because it comes after the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Where there's a, with those days and that period of time, there's a weightiness and a heaviness in those times of trumpets and the day of atonement because people are uh, reflecting, they're repenting, they're inspecting themselves and coming before Yahweh to make sure they're right. Seventh feast in the seventh month and it goes for seven days long. Seven is symbolic of completion. When this comes to pass, it represents that this current age will be completed and the Messianic rule will begin the eighth day. So many believe this coincides with the 7,000th year and that the Messianic 1,000 rule and reign will begin on the eighth. It's also known as the Festival of Ingathering. Like I said, it's also known as the season of our joy. In gathering of the final harvest of the crops for the year. And also prophetically the final harvest of the people at the end of this age. A time of great abundance and great joy as the harvest of crops meant blessing. This is what it literally meant in Israel that it was a blessing when they were able to even harvest their crops. And was crucial. We don't sort of weigh this in today's society because we all just go down to the local supermarket and buy our groceries. But this harvest of the crops was absolutely crucial to them because it was their food. They didn't have food stamps. They didn't have government handouts. They didn't have local supermarkets that would just buy off the shelf. This was absolutely crucial for them to have a harvest and it meant that it was a blessing that Yahweh blessed them that year because they had the crops and the food to be able to eat. This is why they had great joy because they knew that they were going to have food. This is the holy days which is where we get the word holiday in our in our westernized culture. This is the holy days. Holiday that the American day of Thanksgiving is rooted in. It's rooted in this feast time of tabernacles. The pilgrims that were first went out to the US were emulating the days of tabernacle and they had the time of Thanksgiving. But then over time it shifted to the third Thursday in November and is what they celebrate the day of Thanksgiving 
in the U.S. today. But there are many places around the world that still have a Thanksgiving meeting in their services around this time of year. This is what it's all rooted in. It's all rooted in this feast day, this feast time, this feast period of the Feast of Tabernacles. Solomon dedicated the first temple in this season, and that can be found in 8 Kings 1 to 2. When the, temp the first temple was completed, Solomon dedicated it in this season. So we find out about this Feast of Tabernacles in Exodus 23, 16, and the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of your labours which you have sown in land, and the Feast of Ingathering, which is like I just shared earlier, is another way of saying the Feast of Tabernacles. At the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of all your labours from the land. There's also a strong connection between the nations and the Feast of Tabernacles. This tabernacle is also referred to as the Feast of Nations. All up through the week, through that week, every week, every day of the week, they had to offer so many bulls. And when you total those bulls together, there was a, there was 70 bulls sacrificed by the end of the week. And it is said that they represented the 70 nations and that they were an intercession for them. And that can be found in Numbers 29 verses 12 to 39. There's a, a, an organization that's in Israel even today. They, one of their premier events is the Feast of Tabernacles. And people from all around the nations go there and they have a march up the streets of Jerusalem waving their flags and it's, it's also known as the nations, the feast of the nations. Some of us have been involved in those. It's a remembrance of Yahweh's protection and provision of the Hebrews who spent 40 years in the wilderness. So it's also a time to reflect back and remember and recognize and that Yahweh protected them and provided them for 40 years in the most harshest place on earth, which in and of itself is a miracle. We find out a little bit more about this feast in Leviticus 23, 41 to, 30, uh, 41 to 43. And it says, You shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. For I am Yahweh your God, or Elohim. And again in Deuteronomy 16, 13 to 15, it says, You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, when you gather from your threshing floor and from your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to Yahweh your God in the place which Yahweh chooses because Yahweh your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you shall surely rejoice. So Yahweh commands us to rejoice, to be thankful for the provision of God for the past year, for his blessings and protection over our lives, families and fellow believers. And it's not until one sits down and reflects on the last 12 months that you can actually look back and see where Yahweh's been on your life, where he's done things in your family, when he's done things personally. And then it's the time to sit down and also and reflect back over the last 12 months to take stock and to see where you were 12 months ago to where you are now and to see all the wonderful things that Yahweh has done. And in Luke 2, 13 to 14, it says, And suddenly there was the angel of a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to all men. 
So here we see that this period of time is when the angels were rejoicing and this is the time of our Messiah's birth. They were rejoicing and praising in this time as also. This Feast of Tabernacles is also known as Sukkot or the Feast of Sukkot. What's Sukkot? Sukkot is the Hebrew for the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's just simply referred to as Sukkot. The practices of Sukkot are to live in a temporary dwelling for the duration of the feast. For example, it is often, especially in the land, and many people do this, they make their own booth. They make their own temporary dwelling or live in some sort of temporary dwelling, whether that would be a tent or whatever that may be. But they, it's often people make, make uh, these booths, these temporary dwelling booths, and, and they decorate them with different fruits and branches, and, and they remember Yahweh and rejoice. So that's why it's called Sukkot. They remember the feast, and many people go camping, dwell in tents, and just have a good time for eight days. Have a really good time of fellowshipping and and discussion and just relaxing and enjoying the time. They're remembering the feast. They've got in their harvest. They're rejoicing. It's party time. They're commanded to rejoice. So the first occurrence of this word Sukkot is in Genesis thirty three seventeen, And Jacob journeyed to Sukkot built himself a house and made booze for his livestock. That word booze is the livestock, a lean-to. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. And again, we see in uh, Leviticus 23.42, you shall dwell in booze, Sukkot, for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall bell dwell in booze. Israel lived in tents or sukkahs in the desert for 40 years. God provided for them the whole time and protected them, gave them water and food. Their clothes never wore out, nor did their feet ever swell. He covered them with a cloud by day and a fire by night. This is a time of remembering that God alone is our true provider, shelter, and protection. So Sukkot's or booths or temporary dwellings come in many shapes and forms and I'm just going to show you a few of them now and we're going to be working our way up the scale. So here is a real primitive, the bottom of the rung, <laughs> rung sukkah. This is what you may found fine with shepherds or people that watch over their crops. This is a really basic Slap together, sukkah. Then we move up to the middle class. And this is what you'll often find in Israel today, where they will build on their, their verandas, their patios. You'll see these absolutely everywhere. There's actually kits that you can buy at this time. And, and that's more of a um, one-off a residence where they would, yeah, build their sukkah. And then we have... The Ye Butte ones, and this is a uh, this has all the tri tri trimmings. <laughs> so this all the different types of sukkot. It doesn't say how and how you should do it. It just says to do it. It doesn't give a lot of uh, how many cubits long and how many cubits high. It just says to do it. Build a temporary dwelling. Sukkah is actually a Hebrew word, and it means a hut, a tabernacle, and a tent. The root of the words is suk, and it means to cover a booth. And we can see it there in the pictograph, it is a samik and a kaf. The samik being the letter on the right, and the kaf being the one on the left. The samik is a picture of a thorn, representing protection. And the kaf is the picture of the palm of the hand, representing a covering. Combined, these mean a protective covering, which is what Yahweh did for them, literally, 
for 40 years. And this is represented in the temporary dwelling. This is represented in how they literally lived under God's protection. The watcher over the crops or the shepherd of the flocks or herds would construct a covering, a booth, as a shelter from the sun, wind and rain or protection from even wild animals. So we see that in those pictures that we showed earlier. These coverings were often constructed on an elevated position and from materials readily available such as bushes, thorns or small trees. In English, we exchange the S to the SH sound. And this is how we get the word shack. Shack is a is a probably a, one of the best examples I can think of of what a temporary dwelling may be like. In the feast of Sukkot, when one dwells in the temporary dwelling or the booth or sukkah, they get the sense of this divine covering and protection by being out in the elements rather than being cozied up in a secured house or building. It gets you out of your comfort zone. Sukkah. Sukkah is singular and Sukkot is plural. A Sukkah is a booth, tent or lean-to. It's a temporary dwelling. Shepherds had these all the time when they were out in the pastures with their sheep. Soldiers also had these when they were out on military campaigns. You see the uh, the, uh, the um, old movies where you see the... the, the the armies go out on military campaigns and you see all the tents set up on the uh, field there. They're like sukkahs, they're temporary dwellings. The Hebrews lived in these for 40 years in their wanderings through the desert. Today people build their sukkah and live in it for seven days or they eat their meals in it for seven days or sleep in it for seven nights. I want to sh uh, share a funny story about this time. True story. And it's a story about a, Jew, a devout Jewish family that moved into a posh high-rise building in New York. Just before Sukkot, the family erected a sukkah on their balcony, a bit like the one we saw earlier, and made plans to live in it for the following week. Almost immediately, several of their wealthy non-Jewish neighbours filed a restraining order claiming that the hut was an eyesore and violated numerous city codes, not to mention their high society sensibilities. The next day, the two sides were in court, standing before a judge who happened to be Jewish. After hearing from both sides, the judge began lecturing the builder of the sukkah, you don't live in some low-rent neighbourhood, you just can't have a makeshift hut on Park Avenue. What's more, you can't build anything anywhere without a building permit. Then, with just a hint of a smile, the judge looked at the defendant and said, I hereby give you eight days to take down that hut or pay a thousand dollar fine. Next case. <laughs> By observing and taking part of dwelling in a temporary dwelling, it reminds us of the provision and protection of Yahweh. Also, it could possibly, it could be possibly preparing us for events to take place in the future takes us out of our comfort zone, away from our security and into his. Gets us away from our air conditioning, our fires, our stoves, our ovens, our recliners, our lounges and our remote controls. It gets us totally away from that. Gives us seven days, eight days to chill out, relax and enjoy each other's company, being in his presence. So in Deuteronomy 31, 10 to 12. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time, 
in the year of your release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all of Israel comes to appear before Yahweh your God, in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law, or Torah, before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn to fear Yahweh your God, and carefully observe all the words of this Torah. Every seven years, the whole family was to go up to Jerusalem, where Yahweh put his name. The priest would read the Torah that year. This is how they learned. And the Torah was refreshed to them. They didn't have Torah scrolls in their homes. They didn't have 15 Bibles each. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have tablets where they could just scroll through all the books. They only heard the Torah every seven years, the whole family. So that means by the time a child was 21, they heard it three times, other than the instruction of the father, who it was his responsibility to lead the family into the ways of Yahweh, because the males had to go up every year. So it puts it in a bit of perspective of how readily available it was to them. Another commanded aspect for the Feast of Tabernacles is the waving of branches and fruit before Yahweh. This group of four different species of tree branches is called a lulav, which I believe means a closed palm frond, a lulav. And we see this in Leviticus 23.40. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God for seven days. Now in the days of Messiah and when they had the temple, there was also a water libation. It was also a part of the daily activity of the Feast of Tabernacles. Every day the priest would draw the water from the pool of Siloam and pour it out on the altar. This was known as the living water. It was also symbolic of praying for the rains to come for the following year, for the barley and the wheat crops. Interesting to note that rain and teaching are the same root word in Hebrew. A direct connection of living water to Yeshua as the living water. And John 7, a lot of this chapter is about the Feast of Tabernacles in Yeshua's day. John 7, 37 to 39, on the last day, a specific day, the great day of the feast, Feast of Tabernacles, Yeshua stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Yeshua was not yet glorified. The Word of God is also referred to as living water. Yeshua and the Word of God is the same thing. If anyone thirsts, if anyone is thirsty, come and drink. Yeshua the Word. The last great day, on this day they would pray for the Messiah. They poured out water and wine on this day. Every night in the also in the temple they would have a mass celebration and have very high poles with four big bowls on each one that would hold seven gallons of oil, just over 15 litres per bowl, times four. These created great lights that could be seen from a great distance and was known as the light on a hill because Jerusalem's up on a hill. You go up. No matter what side you come from, you go up to Jerusalem. The city on a hill, the light on a hill, the light of the world was also referred. These wicks for these huge lights were made from the old priest clothes, according to their history books. The complete Jewish Bible says in John 8, 12, Yeshua spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light which gives life. Yeshua made these statements in this season. These are idiomatic expressions that they all knew. They all knew what he was saying and what he was referring to. And here is an artist impression of what it may have been like. And you can see the uh, some of the big lights with the four bowls and how much light. And you can see all the people celebrating and rejoicing before Yahweh. And up the top there you have the women's court. So you can see them all. And you see the uh, priest on the steps there and they're, they're blowing trumpets and they're rejoicing. They're having a, a good old time because Yahweh commanded them to rejoice. In John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Again, revealing that Yeshua is that living water. He is the word. This time of tabernacles was also the time Yeshua was born. And we know this by tracing all the way back to the events that took place from Zechariah. John, the immerser, or John the Baptist's father, when he had his encounter with an angel in the holy place, we know the time of year when that happened. We know the course he was involved in, the period of time where he served. And he had his encounter with the angel in the holy place. It is also strongly suggested that Yeshua may have been born on the first day of Sukkot and may have been circumcised on the eighth day. May have been interesting. It, 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 not saying that it says it in the scriptures, but it could have well have been. There's something to think about. Or the great eighth day, the final day of Sukkot. Leviticus 23, 36, For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a sacred assembly. You shall do no customary work on it. So this is the eighth day Sabbath that we're talking about. So in this Feast of Tabernacles you'll have at least three Sabbaths in that week. You'll have the first day, the last day, and then obviously the weekly Sabbath will fall somewhere in between that. The final day of Sukkot is called Shemini Atzeret, which is the eighth day of the assembly. It is a Sabbath day, so no work is to be done on it. It's to have a sh gathering together and meet with Yahweh, which we just talked about in the previous verse. The number eight can represent new beginnings. Interesting, a male child is circumcised on the eighth day from his birth. It is also widely believed that eight represents eternity. After the 1,000 year reign of Messiah, a closing of the age and a new beginning of eternity with Yahweh tabernacling with us forever. I said before that it's strongly believed that Yeshua may have been born, was born in this period of time. Tabernacle actually means that God dwells with us. God is among us. And he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. I will dwell with you. I will tabernacle among you. Which is what he did when they dwelt in booths. He dwelt among them. He tabernacled among them. So Yeshua, when he came, God tabernacled again among his people. This is a reason, when you think about the story in Luke, why they, Joseph and Mary, or Joseph and Miriam, couldn't find a room to dwell in, because it was the Feast of Tabernacles. There was no room. The place was packed out to the hilt. That explains why they couldn't find a room, because they were all there celebrating for the feast. Jewish weddings went for seven days, and the eighth day is the new beginning of the couple's life together. Prophetically, an incomplete feast which will be fulfilled when Messiah returns and dwell among us and be our God. And in Revelations 21, 3 to 8, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. 
and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write to these words, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Aleph and the Tav, or in the Greek, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give on the fountain of the water of life. There's that water of life again, freely to him who thirsts. Pretty much exactly what Yeshua said in John 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire in brimstone, which is the second death. So here we see that God tabernacling with us for eternity and we tabernacle with him. Matthew 17, 4 Then Peter answered and said to Yeshua, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles or three booths. One for you, one for Moshe and one for Elijah. This event took place in the in the season of tabernacles. They wouldn't have been talking about this language. You don't build tabernacles any other time, unless you're a shepherd or a soldier. This event happened. That's why he said, let us build a booth for you. We can understand different passages in the New Testament by understanding certain terms used for the feast. For example, Matthew 13, 38 to 41, The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares of the sons of the wicked one, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in fire, so it will be at the end of the age that the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. So it's interesting here that the ones that are gathered out are the wicked, the righteous remain. In the future, after Messiah's return, we will be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, reinforcing that the feasts are not done away with, as they are Yahweh's feast and Yahweh does not change. So that verse we just read out in Matthew, you see all idioms in that phrase, that the, the harvest, harvest are done at the end of the year, talking about the Feast of Tabernacles when there's that final ingathering. Again, the, tabernacle, the, the feasts are not done away with. Consider this verse in Zechariah 14, 16 to 17. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh Zavaot, and to keep the feast of tabernacles, feast of Sukkot. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, on them there will be no rain. Now we know that this has not happened yet. So going off what is taught today, which is commonly a held belief, they kept the feast up until Yeshua. And then Yeshua said, you don't have to do those anymore. And then he says, you have to do them again. That's the common belief. Because they're, all the feasts are done away with now. This verse goes totally against that doctrine and that theology. This is just absolutely ridiculous and is a contradiction of what the scriptures say. Which we just read out in Zechariah and of who God is. This doctrine where the feast of, and, and the Old Testament and all these things are done away with, I'm telling you now, this is the doctrine of men, and this is also the doctrine of demons. It goes totally against what the Word of God says. 
and who God is. God says, I do not change. I do not change. And Yeshua himself says, I am the same yesterday, today and forever. The future reign of Messiah will also start in this season. So what does this all mean for us today? We are to remember and observe this eight-day period as it is an appointed time to be with Yahweh. The first day and the eighth day of Sabbath, no work is to be done on them. We are to gather together and meet with each other and with Yahweh. It is a festival, a hag, which explained is a circle. A hag is a circle with Yahweh in the centre. Being the focus, by partaking in this festival, we are joining the greater worldwide circle of believers. So we are joining the worldwide circle of when people are gathering together at this time also. We are to live and dwell in a temporary dwelling. We are to rejoice and be thankful for all of Yahweh's provision, protection and blessing over us for the past year. We acknowledge that Yeshua is the living water and the light of the world. It is a rehearsal for the future Feast of Tabernacles when God will dwell and travel among us once again. We know that we will be celebrating this feast after the return and rule of our Messiah, which we just read out in Zechariah. Revelation 19 verses 7 and 9, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. So here we see this theme of rejoicing and preparing ourselves for the marriage of the Lamb. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So we see that the marriage supper of the Lamb is connected to this Feast of Tabernacles. Also this is connected to the five wise virgins. And while they went to buy the bridegroom came, and those who were ready who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. What wedding? The marriage supper of the Lamb. So with that being said, happy Sukkot, happy tabernacles, rejoicing in the tabernacles. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it gives us instruction and teaching on some things to do. Help us to understand what to do and to be pleasing to you, Father. Father, we thank you for your feast. We thank you that they are, they are there to provide it, to, to, to be a blessing to us. Father, for us to draw near to you and get to know you that little bit more. We thank you for the day, our times of blessing. And Father, I just pray that you help us to understand these things. Father, so we can be closer and draw closer to you. We bless you and we praise you. May we be there, Father. For you said, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, we want to be part of those people. Father, I pray that we would hold on to you until that time. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.